Okay, now I want to do, I want to set the preferences here in live. So, before we do that, we want to do audio preferences. We're going to go to live here. Now, if you're running a PC, we're going to go to options. If you're on a Mac, we're going to use preferences. And here we go. This is our preferences window right here. I'm going to go to audio. I'm sort of my audio preferences now. Now, always when you start your computer, of course, you're going to have your interface plugged in. Then you'll start your interface, turn that on, then turn your computer on, and then, of course, launch live. So that's why I want to see it right now. Now, here's this driver type. So it's not selected here. You'll see a list of drivers. So using our core audio for our Mac. Next, I'm going to select device. So I'm going to use my Digizign Inbox 2 there for your device input. See that? And then for output, we're going to use this device right here. Now, once I set that up, you'll see the other configurations come out here that I can configure. We can do latency, sample rate, and test as well. So, but first, I want to do is I want to go ahead and do input, input configuration. Now, see here, I've got one and two. That's my configuration. See, I'm just going to use one. As a matter of fact, let's use three and four, actually. So you'll just see it in the, later on in the track. It's good. And next, I want to set the output configuration. So here we go. We've got one and two for output. So this means our output that we're using for the output from the hardware. So I'm using the DigiDesign Mbox 2. So we're going to choose the audio hardware outputs that we're going to make available for live tracks. Okay. So every output pair can be used as one stereo out or two mono outs. Okay, so I'm going to press OK for that. And next we're going to do here, this is right, we're going to make sure we're going to go to our in and out sample rate. So we're going to use 44.1. But we have several options. We can do 44.1, we can do 48 hertz, we can do 88 or 96. So, I'm going to use 44.1 for now, since it is CD quality and a consumer rate that's normally used. Then we have default, sample rate, and pitch conversion. Now here, we'll leave it normal. We go highest quality, of course, as possible. But we can always change this later on in the clip, and we'll show this later on in our lessons. Next, we have buffer size. That's 512 right there, as you can see. And we see our input latency. It's going to be like 14 milliseconds here and 14.3 milliseconds here as well. What I'm doing next, just observing that, I want to go now to the Record Warp Launch tab. And right here we can select our file type. So AIF, AIFF was made for the Mac and WAVE for PC, but they're both, both ways now. So I prefer to use WAVE, it's pretty standard around the business now. And then we have bit depth. Now for bit depth, to get the best quality for me, I prefer 24. It's going to be more bang for my buck right there. Now I have to account it. If I'm going to do a, I'm going to record something, I want to have a count in here. I want to count it one, two, three, four, then go. So, for a normal, none of the sense, I'm going to go to my, I usually like one bar at least. It makes it easier for me. Okay, we're pretty much set here now. And we are about ready to record and to use the order system in live. Now, once you set up your audio preferences, you'll notice here that you can see the audio inputs right here. Now, if you don't see this in your session, you go here to View. I need to select In and Out. So here's In and Out. You got it. That's the basic view you get when you actually install live. You go here to View again, go In and Out, and you see it right there. And see here, the output goes directly to the master. This is our output so it's going to the mass which you can see right there now here are the inputs see this here we have one and two and three and four and here's one and two three and four so we have the stereo pairs here and we have the monos right here to configure of course you just go back in here and you'll see it again under audio again you'll see it right here under preferences and we go input configuration that's what we did earlier so this way, you can see the full circle of how we set it up, and then where it appears on the window right here.
And you see it here also. Here's our Q out, which is the one and two outputs. The configuration is here. We'll see the output configuration here under channel configuration. And these are our outputs, one and two. You could have mono pairs, one and two, and stereo one and two. Now once we set up fully and we got our system going properly, make sure our buffer, our buffer size here is at 512. That's for your system. Well, depends on what you have on your system also as well. And we're pretty much good to go here. And here's our master out also, right? Here's our master audio out. You see, it's master audio out. And here's, the, so these are returns on this side. And this is our master. We want our tracks to fill up here. If you wanted to add tracks in the view, let me say you want to put another track in here, you can go back here into our file and we would create more tracks. Insert audio track and then you insert an audio track. As you can see again, its outputs are going to be to the master. And the inputs, as you see there, are one and two stereo, three and four stereo, and one, two, three, four mono. Well, we're set up for audio now. Let's check out the MIDI preferences. Now, at some time when you're recording, you're probably going to want to use some sort of MIDI controller, a keyboard, or a drum machine, either to send MIDI information out from live or back into live. So, we need to set up our MIDI preference parameters, and that way we can talk to any one of our MIDI controllers or just to a MIDI keyboard or a drum machine. So, here we're going to go back into live. We're going to go to Lives options on a PC or preferences on a Mac. And here we have our preferences. And I want to go to the MIDI sync pane right there on the left. Now here in my MIDI sync pane, we're going to see the control services that you can use. This is a list of available native uh, control services that actually work with live that have been tested. And they say, okay, these will work perfectly with live. And it's a pretty big list right here, as you can see. Extends down. Let me raise this up so you can see the full list. There we go. There's a full list right there. You can see the whole thing. Now, I'm currently using Auxium Pro. So, my Auxium Pro, uh, I can use outputs and inputs. So that means I can send information uh, into the Auxium Pro, and Auxium Pro can send information back. And this is done through hyper control. So, I'm going to go here and use the Auxium Pro 61 hyper control in. And then I'm going to use the Auxium Pro Hyper Control Out, which is right here. Now, what this allows is that Auxium will, is able to talk back and forth to a quirky system where I can set up different parameters for different buttons to use and control those parameters within Live. But also, it'll also understand every button in Live and it's already mapped out onto my controller. Now, our great control for this is the APC40 by Akai, which is some of the same things as well. And uh, you'll see it right here in APC20 and APC40 also. Play popular items. And now, so I don't have any of the controls that I actually have that are, that are on this list. But I do have, um, here you go, I do have this. I have my Pro Tools, see? My Pro Tools service here, and I can have a Pro Tools service here also. I can lay it out. Here on this one port here, using Pro Tools to go in and out, send the information back in and out through my Pro Tools MIDI ports. Meanwhile, the Auxium Pro has USB ports. Now, if I am hooked up properly, I'm on Auxium Pro right here. I'll be able to go to my keyboard. I'll see a little light here in the upper uh, right-hand corner. See a little light off right there, upper right-hand corner of the window. That's me playing the keyboard, and so I can see I have MIDI. Uh, going into live and it recognizes the keyboard, so we're good. And here, this is a dump here where, let's say for example, you want to dump a preset. Well, you can do that here. It all depends on what those parameters are and where you would find that on your hard drive. And you need to probably look at the manual for your specific controller or keyboard or drum machine if you want to do some preset dumps. Now, below this we have the MIDI ports that are available. And you can see the ones that are available here. And we see if they're on or off. So these are on, you can see here. We have the um, Mbox 2 control and the Mbox 2 port 1, 
we have the USB ports, I said before, USB for the uh, Auxium Pro, USB-A, and USB-B. And then we have Hyper Control, which is right here. And we can have, now here is a sync. So in case I want to sync out and I want to send um, many time code information directly from my live out of the machine, I can sync back and forth with those two machines. And here we also have remote. I can do remote control via actual uh, controller or keyboard or drum machine as well. And if we're going to do that, I can just turn this on, and we can have a chance to do that in front of the machine if we want to do that. In this case, we're not. But I may even use that here with the Auxium Pro, where I can have it control my live and say, okay, great, we're going to run it back and forth and use remote control for it as well. So, once that's set up, we can see it right here. And of course, we have a mini track right here, as you can see here. And we see the available ins and outs right here, as you can see. Hyper control in, so it says all ins there. And here we have track views, so you're going to have all 16 middle track, uh, mini tracks right there, mini channels, and input output. So if you ever go back and you want to reconfigure, of course, as we did before with the audio, rather than going to the preferences menu on a Mac or options on the PC, you just go right here, configure, plug configure, and you'll come up to this preference window, which will show you what amount that you're in the MIDI section. So that's a faster way to get there rather than going through the preferences or through the options menu. And once we're set up, we're ready to go. And with live, we want to set up the maximum efficiency with our computer system to work with our applications live. So we need to optimize our computer system, uh, particularly to cut back on latency. So we're going to go here to the preference menu again. And the easy way to get there is actually for here in this case to just press option and the comma. And I'm right there. And here it is right here. Let's pull this up. And of course, if you're a PC, you're going to go to options. Now, we can see here that my buffer size is set to 512 samples. And the input latency is at 14.3 milliseconds. And the output latency is 13.1 giving us a total of 27.4 milliseconds. Now, what does this mean? If I'm playing something, or I'm playing a bass guitar, I'm playing a little keyboard part, I'm going into live, there'll be a little latency. I'll play it, and then about 27 milliseconds later, I'm hearing it. Now, it doesn't seem like much, but it is, because you're playing it, you want to play it and hear it at the same time. So it takes some time. This is a computer system. It's got to get the information in. Oh, he's playing these notes. Oh, it wants to go there. It's routed here. It's routed here. And then you hear it back. So between the time you hit it, it's got to go through the entire system and be heard. So that's pretty efficient, actually. But for us, being humans, we want to play it and hear it. So we want to bring the latency down. And I prefer somewhere below 14 somewhere. It's always best. So here, um, Live has given us this test feature, which is really cool. So I can go here and test it out. So about buffer size. Now, if I'm going to use plugins and more tracks, I need more buffer size. I need more CPU power. I need more power from the system. I've got to have a bigger buffer size of data can be chunked out. I don't, just, I don't use this much data or that much data or this much bigger, bigger data or smaller data. So, when I'm doing vocals or I'm going to record into live with a keyboard or whatever, and I'm recording audio in, we need to have a smaller buffer size so that we create this ability for it to just have a small buffer size and to lower the latency. So what I want to do is click here where it says buffer size. And you got to check your interface, whether it's 512 or it's 256 or 128 or 64 or 32. So these are all the multiples, obviously. So in this case, I'm going to go to 128. I press enter. My buffer size now is at 10 milliseconds. See that? Now, to test this out, we're going to go to here. But first, I want to do is I want to set up my CPU simulator. It's on the usage. This is similar here. So I want to raise my CPU up to about 80%, which is good. This time is a maximum. I can get, see if it's going to be going up or down. I'll turn my tone on. Now, the tone can be controlled here. Of course, I get to DB to, zero, to DB0. It's louder or lower. It's softer, see? Okay, good. And now as we hear it, we're hearing the tone. The tone's consistent. It's clean. If I go to a lower buffer size, let's say go to 64. 
Now we're hearing some sort of noise again. See that? We're hearing more noise. Now if I go to 32, we'll hear a lot more noise. There's a lot more noise going on here. Who knows what's going on? So for me, from what I was hearing, it seemed like 128 was pretty good. I'll turn up somewhat, get an idea of what it sounds like. And it's consistent. There's no problem with the power. And this is why we're doing this. We want to make sure that we can test and see if this buffer size is going to be efficient enough for us to play back and to be able to play and then to hear it back at the same time without too much of a uh, latency happening within the system overall. And once that's set up, you're good to go. Now you'll notice here, since I press this buffer on, you'll notice here in the upper right hand corner within live window, it says 80%. So this is giving us our CPU usage right there. Okay, that's good. Let's use my simulator. So I'm going to use it about 120. It's pretty good for me. And I'll keep it there for my buffer size. Now when I start mixing, I will increase that back up to the maximum I want to get to. You know, I may go to uh, 512, or I may go to um, uh, 1024 which will be double 512. So all depending how much buffer size I want to use when I actually start using a lot of plugins, a lot of tracks, and get my system really running, you know, you want to adjust it. So a lot of tracks, higher buffer size, it's going to record into the system of live a lower buffer size. Now also, what we want to do next is we want to go to the multi-core, multi-processor support. Now some computers today come out with these dual-core systems, three-core systems, you know, a lot of cores in there. So that it gives you more power, but some applications only allowed to use one core, or you can use a half core, you know. So what happens is that uh, what Live has done has made it easier for you. So you can use multi-core, multi-processor support. I may have more processors. I may have more cores, a dual-core system. So I can use it all because the support is here within Live. And below this, we have the multi-core uh, rewire, which we'll explain later on when we use rewire. Next, we have plug-in buffer size. So I'm using plugins like reverbs or compressors or uh, EQs. Each one of those requires a buffer size. And I can use it as audio buffer, which I prefer to do, leave it in this system. But in case you want to just adjust that and lower it down some, you can just change it right here and set your buffer size right there for your audio buffer. And that'll set the size for your plugin buffer size totally. So once we've optimized our computer, we're ready to start with more lessons. And the first one will be on Windows next, how to use the live main window. So, we're going to talk about session view. And so here we have files up here, as you can see, over here in my browser. And I'm just going to go here and look at a file. If I want to play this file back and go right here. I will explain more about the browser later on. I'm going to drag this file and put it in here just for now. See, it's made a new track right there, right? And we have a new audio track, which is right here. So, I can now listen back to this file. You can see how the file looks here in this window. And here we have our info view. So here's the info view. So for example, if I go here, it says solo. This is S for solo. It tells me solo, what's good for it. Hit the solo cue switch in the session. Mixer master track is set to solo. So you see that's solo, and this is a solo track. That means a solo, and it's going to go through my master track for that one particular sound that's coming through that track. Or, here this is MIDI, the same thing. So each time I move my cursor someplace, the info appears here in the lower left-hand corner here in my info box. This is a great helpful way for you to get around in live in case you forget something, you want to know something more, or learn something, you can do that right there as well. Another way to do this is also to go to the to view the home view. And here in view, you can see that. Let me go right here, which is help view, and we'll see it right here. This is our help view right here. And here he says live 8.2, includes a number of improvements and some bug fixes as well. Uh, now you can see here we have uh, those release notes, and we have the bridge, and we have free sounds for live users. So it's always good to get those free sounds and put them in. You never know when you eat them. So I like to go here sometimes and see if they have even more new free sounds. If they do, I like to pull them in and keep them. Nothing wrong with that. And here we also have setup custom for live color schemes. We also have lessons, get you to learn some lessons. 
uh, using live, which are right here. And then further down, if you scroll down, we have sounds. You can use these links to quickly access various folders in Live's library. And we have essential instrument collections right here. And here we have reference. Let's say if I see the actual um, Ableton reference manual. And you say, well, where's it at? I'm going to pull it up here. I click here. And then my Adobe Reader comes up, and here's the reference manual for Ray. And I can always go back to here. You can always go back to here and, and view, let's say, find something else about something. Say, Live Concepts Chapter 4. You can go there, and you can do it real quickly. Or you can go through the bookmarks right here on this side and view the bookmarks to see what's going on in live in case you want to figure out a problem you're having and try to figure out how to use it. And let's hide this. So we can use that in live also as well. Now, I'm going to go right back here to where this is at. Good. And if I want to get rid of this help window here, I can go back to view and scroll down to help and get rid of that totally. I can also get rid of info if I want to as well as you can see right there. You go to here. We can get info, it's gone, and it switches out our view here of the clip. So, I'll put info back in here just for now. Now I want to talk more about uh, some other features that come along here with Live. As you can see, we have a uh, clip down here, and uh, we have an audio track. So this is an audio track, I can play this clip. And I can also control its tempo at the same time, too. Hit pressing space bar, I stopped it. Now here, we have the ability, as you can see here, to control the tempo. Let's say I want to change the tempo to be 100. And I play my clip. And it drags out to 100. Now this can be done uh, another way also. I can go here and click on it and then drag up or down. So I want to do 71. That's a little too bad. Now I'm going to go back up. I want to go to 100 again. Now this can also be done live. So I'll press play. You'll hear back the, the clip here. The loop. Now let's go back. Go further up. And I press my space bar again. I stop. Now I can also tap repeat. Tap this little tap button. And this tap tempo button. I can tap the beat two times and it will come up with a tempo. So let's say, for example, I'm playing this loop. As I tap it, you see the tempo changes. So just two taps, and then the live program figures out the distance between the two and says, well, this is this tempo. Now here we have our tempo nudge down. I'm going to measure tempo now. I'm playing tempo. I'm it up. That's a nudging. And right here, we have our time signature. Well, it could be, let's say, 4, 4, 3, 4, 6, 8. This is the time signature. Now, sometimes when you're recording or you have a playback and you're trying to hear whether it's actually in sync with the system, you may want to use a metronome. And right here, we have our metronome. So I click here, our metronome will go. And so I mentioned on would be in sync. Now, for example, it's not in sync with this particular clip because I haven't done that yet. But that mention would be in sync if I reach the camera and go back in here. And turn it off. And now the mention on is off. That's our mention on. Now here we have our files. This would follow the next active and scroll during playback to keep the current song position visible. Okay. Now here, of course, is the current position where I would be at in a song like a song up. Here's our play button, our stop button. This is our global record. Let's quite record right into that chat session. Here we have our overdub button. This is our back to arrangement button, as you can see. Let me turn these two on, overdub over back to range. And this is the quantization menu. So here I click on here, I can quantize to whatever I want to quant. I can have no quantize. I can do eight bars, four bars, two bars. I can do half. I can do a whole bar, which is a whole note. And you also see on the left hand side, right hand side of these items, you see there are some keyboard commands. Like for one bar, a whole note, that would be command nine. For a chord note, it would be command eight. For an eighth note, it would be command seven. For a sixteenth note, it would be command six. Make it easy to get through your quantized values. 
if you want to set a quantized value for that particular session. And here we have, we can draw some particular parameters in. Now here, right here, we have our input. This is our loop, so our start punch. So here you can see this is a punch in switch. This is a punch out switch. So we have a section I want to keep, but I want to punch in a certain section to add some new stuff, and then punch out to keep what at, at the end. And so what I want to do is I want to punch in, then punch out. Now between these two, we have our loop switch. I can click here to activate the arrangement loop. So I have, may have a total eight bars or something. I'll click there, and I want it to loop this entire uh, sequence over and over until I get an idea what I want to do. Now here at the end here, you see this is three, and it says 40. This is the end point. This could be the start point of my punch or the start point of my loop. And this could be the end point of my punch or the end point of my loop. Now here we have, this is our keyboard MIDI control. So this is a computer MIDI keyboard. So for example, my keyboard, which you know, you, you do numbers, you do letters on here, you know, numerics. You want to sit down and write a note. This keyboard can become like a piano. And so I would use the keyboard like a piano. A, W, S, E, D. Every time I hit it, you'll notice here too, I'll notice that our actually line for MIDI, you'll see the indicator light right here in the upper right-hand corner. Next, we have our key map switch, which is for MIDI run. And here we have our key map indicators. And here we have our MIDI map switch as well. Now, next to here, we have our CPU load meter. So as I showed you before, when I went to doing the test tone and we gave the uh, CPU usage simulator, we saw that this uh, approach the same uh, number I had in there, which is 80%. And right here, this is the hard disk overload indicator. So in case I'm using too much hard disk and it's overloading the system, I will see that. And as you already know, this top part here is my MIDI in indicator. And the bottom part is our MIDI track out indicator. Because remember, tracks, like for example, this MIDI track here, can send MIDI data out. Right through there. MIDI 2. So I'm sending it out to some other specific device. So we also want to explain more about this track view right inside here in the middle. Now here we have our tracks, this audio, audio, this MIDI, this little audio track here. Now up here at the top, we have the tile name for that track. The tile name's right there. And here, you could have a scene that's in the track itself. So there's a scene, and <coughs> this could be a track of just what that clip is showing. I can click on here and play the clip. If I double click on it right there, it says DMX Drums, I will see this clip here in the viewer. So I clip viewer down here, which you can see right here. And here, I click on this one, and I'll see the other audio sample right here in this view as well. So in this track view, I can also see, for example, you'll be able to see the audio inputs and outputs we showed you earlier for each one of the tracks. And then we can see that where they're going, the outputs go into the master. Here, they're all going to the master output. We can see the sends, which is A or B, which correspond to the returns over here, which are A or B. We can also change the volume right here. We can it down or raise the volume back up to right about there. I can also solo the solo track right there. Also set up for right here, I can number for a recording. Now here, this is the anchor. So this is the track activated. So I can activate it, nothing happens. But when it's activated, we're back in. So we can activate or unactivate our track right there also as well. We can also pan the track. Now here I can pan to the left or to the right. And then right back in the same position. Anywhere within this range, I can pan that particular track also. I press the stop key. And I can play a track, or, or rather a clip right here. By clicking on it, click on it again, I'm just going to play it again. It won't stop. But if I go in here and stop, I can stop a clip right here. And that clip stops. It's also unactivated. So now, even though we're still in play, as you can notice here from our transport section, we're still in play, but the clip has been stopped. But I have to turn the clip back on. Then press the space bar, I can stop it, or I can press play here. 
the transport and then press stop to stop that clip from playing. Now you can also go over here to the master track, we can control clips from here as well. I can play clips from here. Next possible so I can right there. I can stop this right here. And that stopped it instantly. So this stop clips right there will stop clips. So I can have some more clips here and just hear them back. And this is in my master track. Now the master track has a Q output. So the output here is one and two. And the master output is one and two. We have sends here, post sends. You got this is post. Post sends. And here we also have a solo. It's corresponds to the solo of the playback from any track. I'm going to hit a solo here. That's where that solo leads to right here. So it's going out, but it's going to there. And next to our mass, we have our A and B returns. We can return some effects back into the system, which will explain later on as we get further into our live lessons. Now here on the outside here, we have our show and hide views, as you can see here. See? I'm just coming down and we're going right up and going right back up here again. I can go up here and I go up higher until I get to that point. Now here also you're going to see that I have here I.O. I can show the I.O. hide I.O. So the I.O. is the input output, which you see right here. So I can show or hide the I.O.s. I can also show or hide the see the sends there. The sends are going, they're up, they're in, they're out. So they're showing how the sends as well. I can go here and hide the returns, show hide the returns. All these mixers levels, we got the level, we got the activation, the solo, the record. There's a mixer section. I can hide the mixer as well, see that? And the mixer's hidden. So we can hide certain views of certain items here in the entire window. Also, we also have to hide this clip. We can also hide this whole clip and the clip I info. So before I did info, I went to here, I went to Hide the info, so we got the info, it's gone now, and the clip just widens out. Well, we can do that from here as well. So I can pull the info back in, and I can hide. Let's see, go back to here. And then, to hide, I can just go right in here and say, well, I want to get rid of this. I'm going to hide this or something. When I put my cursor there, of course, the info tells you. I can press Option, Command L, and we have no more clip view. And it extends the overall view of the track section. So it's great to get around and know how to work all the features of this total window for live. This session window is really great to use. It's easy to get access to, obviously, and you can get many different views. So just all in one window, you can move the browser, you can move the info, the clip, and you can also manipulate the track for you to get what you want to get out of it. Now also I want to show you one more thing here. Now here, for example, we have our session view. It's a view of the session. But let's say we have a lot of clips, and we want to arrange the clips out. We go to here to our range view, and then we can arrange our clips out, as you can see here. We'll still see the master and the returns at the bottom of this view. And we can drag and drop files right here, and devices here as well. And we can arrange our clip view right out here for scenes. Well, we've seen a lot of the views now. We want to see the browser view next. Now here you'll see, well, let me the left-hand side of our browser view. And you can show and hide this view right here. Um, it's gone and now it's back. This is our browser view. And in our browser view, we can load up instruments, virtual instruments. As you can see, this is device here. We have instruments. We close this up here. And this you've got virtual instruments. We can load MIDI effects. We can load audio effects as well. So it's a pretty cool way to load up a bunch of effects and get yourself situated in the session. And here we can also load in plugins. But here we can load third party plugins. Let's say if we had some other plugins on our system. We want to load it up into live. We go here and activate. Currently, we don't have any, so we won't do that. And below here, we have our three file browser buttons. Now, this first button here, I have a connection to my library. So, in here for my library, I can load clips in, which is right here. I can load samples. I can load presets. You can also load and view lessons here from here as well. As you can see, grooves and defaults as well. And this next browser, I have it set to my own sessions or my own desktop, as you can see here. Stuff on my desktop. Next below that, we have here, we have some samples. I have some loops already from my own Sample Kings loop library. So if I want to hear one of these, I might go to here and say, well, let me hear this one. Uh, let's try this one. 
it'll load here, you see in the bottom of this browser, and I can play it, a little headset here, I can go like this. I'm gonna control that preview sound. I can do it here from the master, right here from the master. I go to my next sound if I want to, and preview that. So long as this is open, I can preview what's going on. And I can preview it right there. Also, so I can do my little speaker here. I'm just holding, grabbing it down, and moving it down to here. Stop from there. So I can move to this one I want to start this sample from and hear it back again by moving my cursor into the sample view here. And when I do, the cursor turns into a speaker. And that's the view of the sample. Now, that's from that, that far right there. And that's the three file browser in the sample. Well, I can go up here. Let's go back up here. And we'll go into um, another view from the library. Now, here's a library here. I can go to the library and go to samples. And I can go in here to the loop masters. And we got drum loops. And I can go to hip hop. And here are some other files I can look at from different ways as well. You can see it's pretty wide, large files. This is, this is joined out perfectly. This is from Loop Masters, which is uh, given to us through Live. So you want to view some of these, and you can also download some free. This so you're only you can go into Live. Live has a lot of free uh, loops you can also download as well and, and bring up into your session here. And if I ever want to do this, I can always grab this file. I can do it earlier and just take it and grab it and put it in here. And I can either put it in here, let's say. I can grab it and put it in here. And it loads in right there because part is that click right there. If I want to view it, I can do it there. If I want to stop it, I can press here to stop. And you see it, it loads right here into my clip view right there. That's pretty cool with samples right there. So you can load samples in directly through live and you can audition them right there with a live through our live browser. I can scroll up and down, of course, you just saw right there as well. Now we can also do, we can do MIDI clips. So here's a clip here. Uh, the clips folder and I'll click on this and it'll scroll down here and we see MIDI clips here right and we have grooves we have drums as well we have grooves for MIDI clips the hip-hop groove here and then go down to here and we see MIDI clips and I can go to uh, let's go to first one break beat let's go to maybe hip-hop too right here and I can pull this pull this view out a little bit more here and we see the grooves see the grooves right there so it seems like it's grooves as the grooves appear like that so these are just grooves that you have right here. These are just groove files. And then also, I can go to here in drums, go to Electronica, and clip here. These are live sets. Let's say I'm going to go to Blow Out Hill, more sets. I go here to more sets. I clip down to here, and I clip here. And now we see a MIDI clip. See this? And so now you see now, just a little longer to load there as a sample, but now it's playing. There's a MIDI clip playing right here. And this MIDI clip is just playing as a MIDI clip. So I can take the MIDI clip if I want to. And I can drag this MIDI clip if I want to drag it somewhere into a, a, a MIDI part here. And my MIDI clip would appear there. And this would be a MIDI clip, which would be right here. And you would see the MIDI clip. I'll click on it twice. And the MIDI clip will load here into our clip browser as well, just like a sample did. And we'll see the parameters for the MIDI clip. Here we have velocity. And we have the several instruments that we can activate within this clip as part of this whole little kit. This kit here. And see the keyboard's activated. So here, if any of the keyboards, I'm selecting the D key, and that's activating those times that you hear right there. So by hitting the keys on my keypad, I'm able to activate it because this keyboard is activated. The computer keyboard is activated. I can hit these some of these sounds that are in here for this clip. So you can see how we can load clips in. Uh, put them into uh, a single session view right there into a certain part within that track and we can load those clips right into the session. Now next I want to go back out of here and we want to go to instruments. Now here we have instruments right here and these are instruments. So these are particular instruments. And here's our drum instrument here which is the impulse which is part of the live session facts. So I can go in here and go maybe to this thing called brain freeze right here 
and click on this and you'll notice that it doesn't load up into any sort of um, little preview like the MIDI file did or the samples did when I did that right there because these are actually kits. So in order to use this kit I would go here and I would hit the return button and then as you can see it's loading up in there and this kit is loading. And it says look, oh, hang on this too, right? we'll see this too. This device is not available for this version so I may use suites for that one. So I'll go back to another one I might be able to load. Let's just try um, this one here. Hit return. And this one won't load either. So you got to find out which ones will load if you load them in. This is important to know because it took me a while to say, wait a minute, I loaded some stuff in here. Where is it at? Can I use it? Is it, I mean, is it all possible I can use any of it? But when you do find something you can use, you will be able to load it up and just say, okay, great, I can use this kit totally. And that's what's happening here with this one. So you can load up some sounds and load up some preview of some sounds as well too. And this is a preset rack here that I've loaded up here that you can actually use and access. And this is the backbeat. See, this is the backbeat here. And so it's a kit that's loaded up into here. And I can press, I press the A button or S or the D on my keypad. And you can tell from seeing the little me light appear here in the top right hand corner. And that's how we can use and activate some instruments and load them into a track. Or we can also load in MIDI, uh, MIDI files, and we can also load in samples. And right here from our browser, a live browser, right here. Now to launch files within uh, live, what I can do here is I can go to a file I want to get here. So this is an audio file. So I went to Loop Masters Bass loops and I'm going to hip hop loops here and since hip hop loops I can go to here. Of course I can audition if I want to. I'm going to go here I'm going to double click it. And now it launched it right there into a new audio track as you can see right here. And plus you can see here my clip filled up here. And I can even press this to view the clip. When we're in that clip I want to I can press here to play it back. <laughs> stop it by clicking right there. As you can see, we can stop the clip. So, also here's some clip parameters up here right here as well, as you can see. We have the clip parameters, and we have some sample information also right here. And you can loop it, or click here not to loop it. So, we are aware of that. And the length is also right here. We'll explain more at the next video. So, let's launch that clip. I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to launch the clip here. And I want to launch this clip right here. This is a MIDI clip. As you can see, I selected here. It says MIDI. So if I want to see a preview, I can go down there. But right now, I'm going to launch it. So rather than double click it, I can press Enter. Press Return, rather. And there we go. Return. Now that clip is in here on the top. Now you see this clip here. It says uh, Kit LD Game. And you see it right here. The clip appears here. But not the clip, though. We're seeing the kit, which has the drums tied to it. Now, as you can see, the keyboard light is lit up here. At the top of our bar with that keyboard light. So it means I can use my computer to activate some of these notes, so I have a keyboard. So now I'm hitting the D key, and that's activating the tom tom so right there, and the E key. So I can do that, or I can do it with my keyboard as well. As I hit my keyboard here, and that's hitting it. That's my uh, Auxium Pro 61. Now to see the actual clip in the MIDI data, I can click right here, and the MIDI data comes up right there. And we can see it here, the mini data for that track. Now to play it back, I'll click here. Now I'll play the bass line along with it right now. And I go here into the... Go my master's track right there, and we're able to stop the clip. I'm going to turn it down a little bit more here. And I can stop it, and you'll hear the clip stop right there. Now I can also uh, go back in here again. You know something, too, I want to show you. I go to here. It's a little while to cut back in there, right? So I press the space bar to stop it. The reason why I've got this global command set right here is to one bar. And when I set the one bar, that means after one bar goes by, it will let that clip back in. So if I hit it any time before the one bar period, I hit it. It waits to go right in on that next bar that's coming up. 
So that's why it takes that one to get back in. Otherwise, I can change the parameters you can see right here, as we showed you before, for this global quantization command. And that's how that works with Eclipse. Now, if I want to do this um, in a different way also, I can go here manually and I can say, I want to get these grooves going on, and I've got this uh, clip going on there, right? So I can go to here. Let's say I want to get these three other clips. So I can go to here, I'll press Shift on my Mac here, and I'm able to get all three of them right there. And all these adjacent clips come together, and I can take them and drag them right into this one track. As I do, they appear right there. So I can play one clip. So we'll stop that one. Now I'll hit this clip here. Now I'll press the space bar to stop. As you can see, as I hit a clip, the next clip played once that first clip ended. So within live, you're going to play one clip at a time in a specific track, as you can see right there. Let's say if I want to load some other instruments in here also, other clips in. I can go back here, say, and um, here we have this one clip I loaded, which is right here. Let's say I want to load um, this clip and non-adjacent clips rather than contiguous clips. So I'm just going to set the one that's going to here. I'll press Command or Control on the PC. And I'll pick the clips I want to load. I can grab these here and bring them in over here. Just grab them, drag them right here into this track. And they appear right there. See that? And so I have these clips run right there all together. They were not adjacent here. When I pull them in, I pull them into the track. They are now adjacent. And we can do that. Now I can also take these clips, let's say, for example, if I wanted to, I can take them like this and drag them directly into this drop files and devices right in this area right here. And what it'll do, it'll put them all on. So I'm going to hold it. Start it again because I was on the wrong track. We're going back here. Right, here we go. And we're going to drag it and we want to put it directly into this right here. And see, it puts them onto that same track like that also at the same time. So I can do that with one track or make a brand new track also. So I do that. Let's say I wanted to move a clip. I can take a clip here and I can sort of like just drag it down. Drag it down. If I want to copy a clip, I can just right click this thing, copy it, then go back here, right click it again, and paste it in. And undo and undo. These are the many ways I can actually you can move clips around, you can drag them into view, you can drag them to make new files. If I want to make a better view too sometimes. It's going to be too wide. You can always move these edges. They're all like little, little handles on the edge of each, each little um, section here. I can change the handles. I'm not using these returns right here. So I'll say, oh, let's hide the returns. We're not using them. And this way, we get a better view. We can get a better look at what we're trying to do here in the session. And it's good to keep this working area clean so you can see what you're doing, what's in front of you as well. That's how we can work with clips within live. Well, now I want to go over the clip properties, and we can see how these clip properties work. Um, here, for example, I'm in the MIDI notes here. See, it's MIDI notes. And so this is a MIDI clip, as you can see. I can go to here, and now this is a audio clip, as you can see. So here you can see the waveform right here. This is the overview right here we can see. It's a waveform. Here's the clip information. It says sample. Meanwhile, in MIDI, you go here to MIDI, it says notes rather than sample. Let's go over the sample clip first to get a good idea how that works. Now here we have the name of the actual clip. Uh, and we also here have the colors. So we can make clips different colors and we can change the colors. For example, I can go right here and change this color right here. And it is that color right now. We can also go down here and change the time signature from 4-4 four, four, to 3-4 or 6-8, whatever. We can also change the groove. Now here over here, we have the sample itself. So this is the sample, but this information also includes the sample rate, which is 44.1 kilohertz. And the resolution here is 16 bits, and it's two channel, meaning stereo. Uh, if it was one channel, it would be mono. 
Some people should be aware of that. Now here we have, uh, this is high quality rate conversion. And you can see from the information on the info side here that what this does, it just gives us a higher, more sophisticated algorithm, which is uh, used to calculate the rate conversion. So we can get a higher rate conversion, better sound quality. So if you have enough room and a bigger CPU, uh, this is great if you have a very uh, expensive or great CPU, but it's going to be a real drain on your CPU anyway, so be aware of that. Now we have the fade. Now the fade happens at about 0.4 milliseconds between each audio sample. This way there's no pops and clicks. So they go from one audio sample to the other with much more of a clear, smoother feel. And then here, this is RAM. So what this RAM clip mode does is that it allows the system to load audio reference clips into the memory rather than reading them directly from the hard disk. So by playing clips in the RAM, this can help you know your computer's hard disk uh, if it's running too slow. Sometimes it runs slow when you're doing too much. So RAM, I really don't use because my system's pretty powerful. I have no problem for that. Uh, you have to adjust to what your system does. Now over here, uh, we have the edit and the save and this reverse. So we can edit. Now what happens here, I can go up here to preferences and we can edit this sample, this audio file, in a different program. So when we click on here and we go to Preferences, we'll see File, Folder. And here, I can select and browse the sample editor. In this case, I'm using Recycle. Get this out. Now here we can save that information once we do edit it. And here we can also reverse our sample. Let's say I'm playing this, this actual file. I stop it, pressing the space bar, and I press reverse. So it reverses it, and click it again, it's back to normal again. Now here we have transpose. I can transpose this waveform. I can move a sound, let's move it up uh, a whole 12 steps up. Well, that sounds real weird. So transposing isn't really that good on any system I've ever used. But the most you can probably go is probably three to two up. And then that point, after that point, you know, it, it's uh, hit or miss. You never know. So I prefer to keep it around zero. And if I need to transpose, I'll be very careful and try to edit the best I can. Now here we have a little fader for the actual track. And this is great in case you want to bring down the level of this uh, particular audio file with up or down when you're mixing. Just in case it's too loud, you want to get a little louder within the mix. And so I use this also for playback. I want to hear it back a little louder or not. And I can take a play and lower it. See what happens? It's changing that waveform. Almost like normalization does. Now here we have warp. Now what warp does, it sort of makes every sample plastic. Like we can stretch it out or, or put it back in together. It makes elasticity go with it. Because this one I can put it to any tempo. 120, 100, maybe 98 BPM. Either one. And the warp ability is great to have between different sample clips that are audio and different clips that are made. That way I can make certain um, clips groove and blend together to get the kind of groove I want to get out of it. And here we have the sequences BPM. And right here we have, this is the uh, half original tempo. So I can go to this. It's faster. I go to here. Back to normal. One more time. It's double longer. I go to here. It's back to regular. So I can either half original tempo or I can Double original tempo, either way, right there. Now, here we have this is beats. This is the warp mode, the beats. And I have so I can use tones, beats, texture, or repitch. Now, here on the other side of that, we have um, start. This is start for the loops. I have my start point and my end point. If I don't have loops set, this would just go a total of four bars and just stop. Well, the loop set set up here, and I have my position set. Set one. And here's the other length set two, which is the length. So the position and the length of that is the beginning and the end of it right here. And the length of the loop itself. And I do prefer to grab it in here and, and do my looping within the, look up the um, wave file, look up the parameters. It makes it easier for me to view. Now I'm going to go right back here over to the MIDI. And now the MIDI clip properties are somewhat the same. You see it says clip here in the beginning. And the clip name is there. We can change the color. We have a time signature. And below that we have groove. And other properties as well, which you can see right there. 
So, what we also have here that's different though is notes. A set of samples says notes here. So, we have the original BPM of this particular MIDI file, and then we can also have original tempo. We can double original tempo right there. We can do banks. So, for example, I'm sending this information back out to another, let's say, module, a Yamaha ES or a VS2480 or whatever. Or I can, whoops, send this back out here to the parameters and send that information out to that particular bank. Or send the program information out as well. Set the program information up and send it right back out to that bank or to that program uh, for that particular module or keyboard, or even NPC. Now here, of course, is the same thing, a start and stop time to the loop, everything else. As you saw before also, we see here that this is just mainly just the, the kit. But some of these are resources that are used for this particular MIDI file. And I can see the chain of resources here. I can see this here where I have the send in this chain. There's a little verb. You see this verb here, settings for that. And we have each instrument that's in there, in this kit, this drum kit. And I can also go to here, and I can add more. So I can get rid of this one here. In the device chain, we see the rest of it. We can see these tonal settings that are set right here. And we also see the saturated set right here also as well. So we can see how many other source instruments are actually in the chain. And those are some of the properties, the major properties, dealing with clips in live. Working with scenes is a way for us to build on our tracks and to build up songs and to build up sections in songs. Now before, as we played before, we played uh, tracks that were just in a session. For example, I'd play a track and they will all be within that particular track. I'll go ahead and click on the stop buttons here to turn some of these parts off. And now, this is the track. So I can play this track. We'll say I'll play this track. Then that, then that drum part comes up. So this is a more vertical way that we're doing stuff. And most of the time, we do stuff linearly in other softwares. But this software is a little different. So in live, what happens here is that it's right across. So I can do a scene. Up and down the tracks, from across the scenes. And each row can be a scene, which could be a verse, a chorus, or a bridge, or an intro. Or whatever you prefer to be, a chase scene for a movie, or let's say a romantic tale, or some great classical piece. Whatever you're doing can be done in live when you're going vertically across, okay? So here we have scenes. I've got some stuff already marked off here. And the best way to do it, I can go to here. I can go here where it says this too, and I can go to that, and then go here and it says just click on rename if I want to, okay? So, but here, I'm going to play the scene, intro scene. Stop, and I can go to here, pressing stop clips in the master right there. Or I can just press my space bar and play it again. Or press play here, and stop with the master right there. So this is how we can go from scene to scene. Now we can play the scene here. I'll go to the next one. So I can go between scene to scene to scene. This is a great way to move around between next scene to next scene. I can also create a new scene. Let's say, for example, I want to make an intro and I want to select some files for my intro. So here I'm going to press stop here to stop this one and stop here to stop the scenes playing here and stop these scenes from playing here. I want to select specific scenes to play. One intro. This could be my intro scene right there. So I've got these three selected. You see they're on different adjacent tracks, on different uh, tracks all together. And what I want to do here is I can go in here into the drop file and device section here. I'm going to right click. And here at the bottom it says here, capture and insert scene. Or I can do shift command I. So there I do it and now it's inserted that scene. And that scene has now been inserted. You see it right here? And I'll play it. So that's that scene. Then I'll press stop. Clips. Okay. 
so I can also, I want to name this scene now. Let's see, I want to get in here and name it. So I'm to rename. I call it intro. Okay, now what I want to do here, too, I can just take, I want to move it up, I can just grab it and move to the top there, and now it's the intro. So we can take and move scenes around also. I can also copy and paste scenes if I'd like to. I can say I'm going to duplicate this scene and let's get back here. Let's, for a little, let's get up a little bit. Here we go. I can duplicate this scene and say duplicate. And it does. I duplicate that same scene again right there. I might want to take something in there out of that scene. I might say, well, you know, maybe here I might want to come in here and delete this part from this scene. So I have a different scene happening there now without this other part. So I can almost build up to that section. I might also want to add another part to say, I'm to copy this one. And instead of copying and pasting this scene here and put it there, I want this first scene, this first audio part here to play. I want to name this. Let's go back here and name this. I want to rename it here. And I'll call it percussion. Okay? Percussion. And here what I want to do is I want to get to here, and I want to remove this stop button. So now when I remove that stop button, this part will play to the next part. We'll play that right now. Let's go to the intro and play it here. So see if this one stopped it from playing again. So I can go here again and say, I want to keep that one. So go back here, I can remove this one. And now that scene will play in these first three scenes. This little part here will play in these first three scenes that we have right here. After building the tracks up. And it will play right there in those scenes. So I can make a separate intro. I can copy and paste and make a new intro in there. We can copy and paste parts. You can also change tempo. Sometimes you want to change the tempo and say, well, you know, uh, I want this to be a slower tempo. Like if you're doing like a film score, you're doing a commercial, you may have to change the tempo to one part and then go back to a different tempo for a different scene. So, for example, I've got a scene here. Let's say this is this scene right here, which I'll say I call this. So I call this a break or something. I'll call this a break. And so I'll rename this one. Okay, we're in the break. And then what I can do here too, um, I can go here actually and then just say, well, let me rename it again. Let's do something different here. Let's go back to here. And after break, I'll put a comma and I'll put in 100 BPM. Then I'll play the scene. And see what happened? When I put that name in, then I put the BPM, I said 100 BPM. Live recognized the BPM. Okay, it says that this scene should be 100 BPM. Now if I go to my next scene, the one here, or start from any of the scene, or start from this scene here, that will be 100 BPM also. So what you gotta do is you make sure, if you make that 100 BPM, you gotta make sure all the rest of the scenes are gonna have the proper tempo. So if I go back to here, and I put it in, and I renamed this scene. I'm going to go in and put the comma in. I want to make it 134 BPM. And I can say I want to play from here. Then my next scene. Then my next scene. Then the third scene come up next. see if that tempo starts at the top until that tempo change comes in each succeeding scene will have the same tempo that's how we can work with scenes in life when working on a project or just building tracks with any software it's important that you save the session now here in live they call it sets so I want to save this set and save this entire session here so I know what's going on when I pull it back up so in order to save my session, I need to probably go up here and go to save session. So what I want to do is I'm looking at something here. I want to move this down, back down to where that should be at. And maybe check your session. Always check your session. Make sure it's running. Okay, 
that's good right there. And next what I want to do here is uh, I want to go back into here and I want to save my session. So, live sets are about to save is located outside the project folder. Live must save the set into a project folder. Please choose your project folder to save. So, I'm going to go to save as. So, I want to save this someplace else. I'm going to save it on my desktop. And what Live will do here, we'll save it somewhere in the desktop here. Um, and I want to save anyway's desktop is good. So, it's called demo, and I'll press save. And as I do, it makes this file that you can see right here. This is the file it makes. Move this out of the way a little bit. And show you the file. So I really want to show you this file here. This is the file there. You see it's got this live logo right on that folder right there, right? And if I want to open, I can open the session and open right up. So it saves it as this file that you can open back up. And all your files will be saved, saved in there, actually. And they'll be saved in subfolders. If you keep saving more, it may save more stuff in different folders. As I said before, they'll save the audio and save the media. Everything in different folders will be saved on a live session. So it's important to be actually organized. So to further keep that idea going further, um, we need to make sure, for one, we're going to go ahead and audio. Make sure our setup's right there, okay? We want to make sure that our sample rate here is set to the level that we want to have this session saved at. That's important, all right? In this case, we have 44.1, we have 48 and 96 kilohertz. Right now, we're going to keep it 44.1. Next, I'm going to go here to the warp launch record. And here, I want to keep my files as WAV files. These are both uncompressed formats, so I'm going to keep them that way. And I want to keep it 24 bit. Instead of 16, I'm for a 24 bit because it's a much more robust sound, a much stronger sound, and not so fragile. I hear it so uh, digital. I want to hear it at least have some warmth to it, it totally. And that's why I want to go 24 bit, okay? So we're going to make sure those features are set up before you start saving, right? And so mine was already set up right there. So it was already set up, I can save. Now, sometimes I'm working in a session and I may update something. And I may take a file and move it over or just say, um, I put something here and say, well, you know, I want to get rid of the stop here. Move the stop here. Move the stop. So that's a session, that's a uh, scene about a stop, right? And I go back here, and I've made a new thing, new session. I'm going to go update. So I'm going to file update. So I have an update now. So I want to change the name of this. Call this, like, you know, B2 and call the version B2. That must be a different name for the same set right there. I go here. I'll see within that folder. Now it says demo v2 version. See that? And it's in that demo folder. So I can pull that back up. So that's pretty good. But I want to go back to the other one I had before. So I just want to go back to it. I can go here and I can say um, open live sets. And I can go to the folder and open it up. And see it right there, the first one. Let's cancel this out. Or I can go here to file and go to open recents. I can open it. Well, here it is, right here. Open recents. We'll open this one up. And that one will open right up for me. And there we go. It opens up. Now, another thing you can do here with um, building a sets up here on live is to make sure sometimes when you start out with live, you want a specific start out way to start out the entire session. Say, I want to have the reverb here. I want to have three or four, uh, two sends and uh, three or four tracks set up. So you can say, you can go to here. Uh, we can say, new live set. So it's a brand new live set right here. What I could do, I can go here and say, well, you know, I want more than one audio track. I can say here, or go here, and I want to create, and I want to create oh, another audio track. And I may want to create two three tracks. So go here, and I say, yeah. When I start out, I want to start out with this setup here. I want to have two audio in two minutes. So I can have them start, that's why I want to start off from now on. Whenever I start out with it, it'll start that way too. And since you also see here, there's no returns, you want to see your returns. So make sure stuff is up. If you can keep it up, you can see it that way. Then, once it's set that way, so yeah, this is how I want to set it up. Then, you want to go into Preferences. We go to Preferences right here. I 
and file folder and save current set as a default. Now you would click on this and then this would save as a default. But you gotta know where it's saving to. So know on your hard drive where it's gonna be at. In that case, you say you don't like it, you wanna get rid of it. Well, you gotta go back to it and change it. So that means from now on when you open it up, it's gonna open this way. And I wanna keep this. I press save as my default and now it's saving as my default. All right, get rid of that. And I can go back to here and I say, well, you know, open a new live set. Open a new live set. Do I want to save these changes? Uh, do I want to keep this? No, don't save this. Let's get rid of this. I'm not even making a song. And it comes back up, and this is my new live set. See that? Now this has become my new live setup for my uh, system. If I want to get rid of what I just did, I could do the same thing. I would have it the back of the old live set. So these are ways you can actually customize the opening of live, and then you have to make sure you always save, and save it the right way. Make sure you save the wave file you want to save that, the sample rate and make sure that your session is in a separate folder, all in their own separate folders. It's important when you're working in live or any software, using any DAW, you need to save your data. But you not just save it, know where it's at, know how much data you need to save, and know how to bring it back up. Someday you may have to go to someone's house, maybe a cousin or a friend's house, and you want to bring the session over there. You don't want to go there and get started and find files missing and you really can't complete what you want to start when you got there. So I'm going to talk about file management and where to do it. Now for example here we are in the live session and this is my demo here of version 2 which I know works here. Let's go back to here. Always check your session 2. Okay good. Now I'll go over here into the file and I'm going to go to preferences. I'm going to go here, to the side here, let's look at this box here for preferences, and look at file folder. Now here we have the sample editor, of course, and below that though, we have here temporary folder. So when you're working in Live, Live makes a temporary folder of these files we're using or recorded before we save it. It's holding them in this folder for us, just in case you're ready to save and you want to keep that file. So, it saves in a temporary folder until you're ready to save. And when you are ready to save, you can save that file and save everything. So here I'm going to close this off. And let's say we save this and we want to save what we did and we want to save it back. Okay, we can do save live set. Okay, I can say I want to save this live set as, and I can save that. And it takes right back to the same folder. Now, I can also go in here and say save live set as. And I can do that. It'll save it as a new name. I have to change the name. I'll save it as something else. But it'll still be in the folder under the same idea of this folder. It will have these, this, this folder where I won't have everything I want to see in there. Like, for example, you see here in this session that I have several different files. I've got several audio files here. One, two. I've got an audio file here. I've got a percussion audio file here. But you do not see a folder with that. This is project info. And then it's just project info. So what's happening here is that Live is pointing to the specific files in my library and say, okay, these files in the library are the ones that we're going to use. It's not actually saving them to this live project folder. Okay? So it says this project info, it's a project info for this folder. So I'm going to cancel out of that. So if you want to actually save your stuff, you want to go back here, you can do another thing. You can go back here and save a copy as. Now saving a copy as will do some of the same things. I can save a copy as, but only save a copy of this. You know, I can save a copy of this as a copy, and it'll do that. But if I do it, it'll just save a copy. It'll still point to the same files. So it's not actually going to do anything but make a copy of it and say, okay, this is what this is going to be. What I need to do is I need to collect all the data and save it all. And Live does that right here in the file. We're going to collect all and save. We're going to collect all and save. And now we have all this other can save here. We can save factory files in library. We click on that, yes. Because we want to save those factory files, the stuff that we got, that's in our library, we got from live originally. We want to save those in the same folder. We want to save files from the library, factory files from library, files from other projects. I may have a different project, and files from elsewhere. I may have a file from off the computer, some girl's voice somewhere. I got from a TV show or something, put it in there. 
Well, you want to save everything. That's how we do it. And so now, I'll press OK. And now, it's saving all these files right there in the folder. Now, if I go back to my folder, and I go to Save Copy as we'll say, and in my folder, now we'll see, look at this, it shows us everything. It saved everything. It saved those samples that I had, those audio files. And it shows you, okay, there it is. Master Loops, it shows bass. Okay, we got this, it's hip hop. And then we look at these files, it has an ASD file. This is a wave analysis file. So it analyzes the file in case I want to change the tempo up or down. So it saves everything that we need to have in case you want to move this session and copy it, get this whole session and grab it and take it to someone else's house or to the studio to finish the project up with. And this is how we want to save our data. At the end of the day, you want to make sure everything's on there and you want to go someplace, make sure you get everything that you actually have from your library and from any of the drives you have hooked into your computer. That's important always to do that, put that data. So, let's go back to here. And I want to show you one more thing also as well. We can go to File here, we can go to Manage Files. Now sometimes you go to someone's house, you're missing files or something, you can go here and you can see here that there's a file management that we can use here within Live. And this file manager helps organize all the files you work with in Live. Samples, movies, presets, uh, live clips, even live sets. So, I can look at the current live set, this is the one I have now. I can look at this live set belongs to the demo. Look at this one, Manage Project. So, I look at the project, it looks at the project, it's going through the project, and it's looking at everything here. See, it's looking at everything I have in the project. At least I want to go to Manage a Project, I want to make sure all the files in the project and nothing is missing. That's important. So, here we got the project contents. This project contains 3.5 megabytes of data. You know that already. We have two live sets, that's true. Uh, we have zero live clips, we have zero presets in there. We have 17 media files in there, that's right. And here you see there are no missing files. That's important to realize too. But when it looks at that project folder, it's gotta say, look, there's no missing files, everything is there. It even shows external files as well. So it's a great way to look at the management of your files and the management system to make sure nothing is missing and you're good to go. So sometimes I'm making up tracks and I have MIDI files that I want to save, or clips that I want to save into my clips library. It might be a backbeat, could be some sort of special drum beat I want to use again in another project. So we want to export this clip into the library. Here's how it works. I have a clip here selected right here. And in order to put it, I want to make sure it's in a folder so I can find it later on. It would be nice to have a folder for it. So I'm here, and I have some electronic drums, some electronics right here. And I'm going to go here, I'm going to right click, I want to create a folder. That folder is created right there. I'll name the folder. We'll call it My Clips. And that's the folder name. Now I'll take the clip here and I'll drag it to that folder. And you see it appears in the folder right there, okay? And you see that. And that clip appears right there. Now, suppose I'm going to do multiple clips. Let's say I've got this uh, backbeat, i got the break section, i got an intro. I want to save these clips. So I have these clips here. I'll just select the first one. Then I'll shift-click to have all of them. Now I'll take these clips and I'll drag them into the same folder here. So I'll go to this folder here. And now, you'll see this appear here. It's not... It's like a clip like before, it's multiple clips. So it comes up as the kit name, as you can see right here, with the live logo. So let's extend this out a little bit. I want to just extend this section of the browser out so you can see it. And here it says a live set. So before it was just a clip, but now it's a live set. It means like a session set. And it's a folder. So I'm going to click here on the triangle, open this folder up, and you see here it says MIDI. It says MIDI 1. And we say MIDI track. So now I'm going to to a folder again, open this folder up. Now we can see the separate tracks, each one of these separately. And you can see them going right into there. So it happens automatically. So it just opens the track up. It says, okay, we're going to save it. So I open the track up. I saved all the clips in the one folder here. Maybe right there. So I can save a clip and I can save multiple clips. But sometimes you're going to get a dialog box. 
and I'll show you how that works here. Go back to preferences. I'm going to get the file folder right here. Now here we have collect files on export. So it's set to always. So it's not even asking me to prompt me for any information. So I can go back here and say ask. We're going to ask now. This way, we'll have live ask you each time you want to save something when you want to save all the parameters. This is important. You need to know that you can save it all or not. So we'll stop that. And I'm going to go back in here again. I don't think I'm going to take this file we just made up here. I'm going to right click it. I'm going to delete this file out. What a trash. Perfect. Now, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to grab all these clips right here, drag them to my folder. And now we get the dialog box. You copy, move documents into a project. If you choose live, can copy files used by these documents, you know, like the samples or whatever, into the project. And you can select the location for which the file should be copied. So it means it'll copy everything. If I have something uh, linked to it, say it's a loop or to a sample, or to a particular drum sound. Well, it'll find all this information and make sure it's all copied at the same time and stored in the same place in the export. So, we press copy, and now it does it. So now I'll go back here again, and you'll see here, the same name appears here, kit LD room, open a folder, and now it says MIDI again, and we see the files here. So if any files were belonging to it, it'll be saved also and link to it as well. So we save the clip, we save multiple clips, and we saw the dialog box which helps us to realize that if these clips are linked to samples, we'll save those as well also. So export the content of the project. So let's save and export the entire project out and save the project also in our library. That's how we'll do that. Now we're going to go here up to the top and we're going to go to my browser here. I'm going to look for it. Let's see. Look at my desktop. Here's the desktop right here. So I'm looking for the project. Here we go. This is a demo project right there. So I'm going to right click, and here it says Project Manager. So I'm going to Project Manager. So I'm going to make sure we get all the clips out there. And you see we have it right here on the right hand side of our window. And we have the Project Manager. So we're checking in no files in this at all. And you see the project internally here, uh, the external files, none to be shown, and we can export to library. Let's pull this dialog box up here. There we go. And now we can see, once you turn that diamond down right there, you can copy these files. But before you do, you want to make sure that you have all the files, including the files that it links to and the samples it might be linking from also that are on the hard drive. So we're going to go over here, back over to file again. And when we get here, we're going to make sure we go to Collect and Save. And once you select Collect All and Save, then you're ready to go. That means it's going to collect all those files, save them, then it's ready to export those files. And let's export those files right back to the library. So export everything from this entire project into the library as well. Now, sometimes you also want to import and maybe export MIDI files. Let's look at that too here. We're going to go right here. And I've got some on my desktop here. I've got one on my desktop here. It's right here. And it's easy MIDI right there. Go to here. And I'll pull a triangle down. I have several MIDI files here, MIDI tracks. I can take them here. I can drag. I'm going to drag a file here. I'm going to put it right here into the browser here. And here we go. Let's drag it right to the top here. There we go. Now you notice too that here in Live, that it recognizes the file once you drag it into it. It won't say, well, you want an audio file, a MIDI file? Nope, it's either. It recognizes it totally. So now I'm going to drag this next file over here to it. Get this over here real quick, if we can. There we go. Put the mouse up to here. And then I want to drag it up to the top there, right there. So it's got two MIDI files right here. Now, if I want to take this MIDI file and export this MIDI file, you can do that. So I can go there and see right there, right click, it says export MIDI clip. See that right there? I can export this MIDI clip out by just right clicking. You can also see that also here in the file. 
We'll go ahead and file over here in the menu bar. And see, export MIDI clip. So we can export that MIDI clip out also. Now if I grab both of them here, let me take this one and the one next to it. I'm going to sh click shift. We have both of them. Now if we go here and we right click, that option is gone. And the reason why is because live cannot export two MIDI files. So and export one standard MIDI file. And it can't read a file that's a standard zero file. Now, there are two types of MIDI files there are. Dot O files, where the tracks are all together and they're all in one file, or a standard one, MIDI standard one. And that's a file where you saw right here, you see right here it says easy, that it's a MIDI file, but all the tracks are separate and there are separate MIDI files within this one file. So I can import those separately, but if I have, for example, I have one right below that you'll see here, which is called Mercy, I go this one, and it's a dot o file. See, it can't do anything with that track. So the problem is that live won't recognize a dot o. So make sure if you are going to import files, it must be a standard one type MIDI file. Now, the beauty of having live is you can get some free live packs. You know, some great sounds sometimes. And you can get that directly from Ableton's website. Now I love this newest software I have here, which is 8.2. And load it up in here to my system. We got a bunch of new sounds. So uh, I got here to sounds, you see. And I have some new stuff here. And you can also go ahead and set up here. And let's see, here we go. Free sounds for live users. So I click right there. And I see the bunch of free sounds I actually got here. And I can pull in some sounds here. Uh, I have a string bass. So that's a little bass I got there, and then we got some other stuff here. We got some keys. Okay, so a bunch of pianos. And I can go here. Let me look at the file. I'll say you unloaded it. Select it right there. And I'll select it. It'll say the price. So some of these files can't be used on some devices too as well. So I think a lot of them are just made to be used maybe in suites or something here. So we're gonna go back to here. And here's the blues key. So we got some little blue sounds as well. So to get these live free packs, I'm gonna go here and head to my browser here using Firefox. And here we are at the Ableton website. So we're in our website here and we go to downloads. Downloads right here, and I click on downloads. And next from downloads. We want to get some free stuff. So let's go on here. You go live packs. Click right here on live packs. And now we can see some stuff you can download. So uh, I can go here, for example. Let's look at this. This doesn't look too bad, but it's a pretty big file. It's like too long to download for us to actually show you today uh, in our lesson plan. But you can see. And this has approximately 73 racks. It's got 17 drum kits, drum racks. And it's got uh, six live sets. And 85 live clips. That's a lot of clips right there. And yeah, that's a pretty big pack here. So, and it's got a lot of these uh, Sonoka Japanese Deco percussion. So, let's do it so quick. I can download here. Oh, here's one right here. We'll click here for more information. So, I'll go back and look for more information. Make sure I'm going to download. There we go. And we can see the size here. This isn't too bad, not too big. So we'll go here and we can download it. Now, it says here save file. I'm going to say yes to save it. Those are zip files too. And you see them are downloading right now. And as it, once it downloads, as it's downloading here, you'll see it as it goes by here. But once it does download, we'll take it and we'll load the live pack in and show you how that works. Now, once I've downloaded my live pack and I want to load it up into my library in live. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go navigate to it. So, as you can see, I already did here. It's from my desktop. Got sent to my desktop. I saved it there. And now we see it here. That's the folder. And this is the live pack. 
Now, if I want to load this live pack in my library, I just double click on that live pack and it's loaded directly into the library. It makes it that easy. And if you want to export a project with the live pack, it's very simple. You just grab hold of it in that folder and then you would just right click it and you just want to manage projects. Now, I want to talk more about the library now. When you actually are working with live, and let's say you're working on a laptop, sometimes it runs pretty slow when you're running with a hard drive. It only runs at about 54 RPM, so it's pretty slow. And you need to transfer your files to um, a location that's going to be better for you. So you can actually take those files and, and view them. It makes it much easier. So what I would do normally is I try to make sure that I can go to a drive that would be easier for me to use. So I'm going to go here to Live, go to Preferences on a Mac and Options on a PC. And here we go to File, and we're looking at here at the preference. Preferences. And I'm also here in File, which you can see right here. Now, I'm going to scroll down here a little bit here. And we see Browser and Collect Files for Exports. We can see there before we saw it last time. And temporary location also, which is very cool to have. What I want to do is I want to find out where I can actually save these files at. And here, I'm going to go right down to library. So here in library, I can change the location of my library. The library could be pretty big, so you got to make sure that you know where it's at. So you're going to take that library and transfer it to an external drive. That might be a little bit bigger and run a lot faster. So you may need to even repair your library at some point. You're not too sure if all the links are proper. And so we can repair our library, and what will happen is that Live will go out, search the library, and make sure all the links link up properly, and repair any files that aren't linked the way they should be linking. So if you want to change location, go here. We go to change location. We select the hard drive you want to store our new library on, it'll copy of the library files and store on that drive. We've been using our mouse so much to click through everything here in live and it's not really necessary. You need to learn more of the keyboard commands which will help you maneuver much easier. Now here for example I am in instruments and the way to really get around is to use the arrows. So I can use my um, up and down arrow to run through. I can go say, open this up for example. I'm here in live and I can use the right arrow to open up that folder. I can open the next folder up and I can scroll down using the down arrow, pick the folder I want to open and use the right arrow. Then keep going down if I want to. I may want to get here to snares and say use the right arrow again. If I don't want to find what I like, I can scroll back up, use the left arrow to close and go up, close. I can use the left arrow to close out anywhere I want to close out and scroll up and down with my up and down arrows. It makes it much easier. You just hold it down or just keep scrolling right down to where you want to go and see what some effects will. Let's use the right arrow to open those effects up. We can scroll down and look for effects. And we can scroll back up. As you can see, I scroll back up. I use my left arrow to close that folder. We got a rack here. I'm look at this rack. Okay. So, it makes it easier than having to use the mouse. Much, much easier. Left arrow again, we'll scroll up, and there we go. Now, and we're in. And it makes it easier to maneuver around that way also. Particularly when you're trying to look for files and it's hard to find them. Now, another way to actually look for files is to go here and search for them. Now, here we've got this magnifying glass. I open that up, and now I can put the word to see base, it's already in there. A bit of preliminary before I start a lesson to make sure I can do it. So I'm going to click here and go to base. And I'll select go. And it's still looking for files. See? It's pretty fast. I couldn't say stop because it's still going to keep looking for more base files on one of the drives. And now I've got base sounds up here. A lot of base sounds. As you can see. I can grab them, of course, and scroll right back down and view these files and see where they're at. So I can search and use the browser to search to try and find files. That's the best way to go about it. It makes it much easier.
and you're, you'll have less problems with it as well too. So let's have fun. Something I like, I like this bass here. We'll say it's a stamp bass. I might find something. I might not be even authorized, so you gotta be aware of that too. Make sure the latest version on your system. So I'm looking for something here. Maybe it's P boots. And this P boots loads up right here. And we got P boots. So we can load up some files. Um, I'm gonna go here now, just close this out, and then close this string bass thing out. And close this out here for instruments. Good. And he's got some stuff in the library. Now here we have samples, okay? And this is in the library already. And we've got loops and stuff. I'll pull a loop up here. Cycling, we got forms, we got loop masters. So I can always sort of using my mouse, I can scroll up and down here, and I can go for drum loops. Okay, so now I got hip hop loops. And here I can get a lot of drum loops. I can audition them. Now for an audition these files, I can just do the right click. And I audition that file. That's pretty cool, right? I can audition that file if I like it. I can just click on this file, of course. Double click it and it falls right into the window here. Now I could hold on to that file. I can turn the sound down here. And this file could run. So listen to the file right now, and what I want to do maybe is look at something else. Look for a bass loop that go over there maybe. So see what happened? The file is actually running. So I'm auditioning files at the same time. What's going on here is that What's going on here is that while I'm listening back to that drum loop, I can also audition files. And what live does, even though you can see this file here is at 90 BPM, and it's still going to go and say, okay, this file, I'm going to still make it match the file already playing. So we can compare the two. I might want to use it. So it makes it much easier to find files that fit. So I can play it again. I look for a file. I'll use my right arrow. So I can audition files easily. That loop can keep running, and I can keep auditioning, which makes it so cool with live. And that's how it works. We can search with the browser and the user keyboard commands, but I really love using the up and down arrows to search through the browser section. We've got through the browser and sometimes I'm searching this browser, I wanna move around better. I like to find some stuff and so, generally, you'll notice that we have five ways of actually finding uh, devices or plugins or samples or whatever. And here we have live devices here. I can go through here. I can, these are going to remain the same. Live devices are always going to be there. This plugin is always going to be there. Now to activate this, um, which I haven't done yet, we're going to do that right now. And we can activate it. And what happens is this preference window opens up again. And here in the preference window, where do you want to look before those plugins? You know, you never know. So we're going to do here. We can do a rescan. See, it says rescan. It's going to rescan for third-party plugins. So we can do a rescan here. And it's scanning. And I believe it comes up with nothing. No third party plugins here. So we can have VST. Uh, we can use VST plugins, custom folder. And I can say yes, but nothing to scan. So I have to use nothing at all. But you may have it on your system. Here in our system, we have nothing at all can actually view or to scan to get from our system. So let's get you a scan. And you're looking for your preferences, or you're looking for actually plugins here at the preference store. And I'm gonna close this out. And here, it actually came with some plugins. It came with battery, and I also have machine. So I can use my machine, I can use my machine effects, and these are VST plugins I can use. See that? So now that we can use these plugins, 
this is great. I can pull machine up and use it right here within my live software, which is great. Now here below that also, we have library. Now these can be configured to whatever I want. These are three different folders can be configured anywhere I want to. So for example, this is set for the library, which I prefer to have one be the library. This one is set to a group of files I have on my drive. And I can go in here actually and go up here and say, well, look, this is a demo. This is all the stuff I have here. This is the desktop. See, it's a desktop. So if I have some stuff on desktop, I can get it from there. And here, I have stuff on my drive right here. Let's see what's here. This is stuff from the drive. This is from the hard drive also. And this is a folder that I have. There's a parent folder. If I navigate out this folder, double click on it, and this is my hip hop drum kits. See that? So I can click on it again, double click it, and I'm back inside the folder here. And I can pick whatever I want to pick on here to addition, to look at, and anywhere I'd like to. Now I have these three folders, right? So what I can do also, say from right here in the desktop, I can set what I want this folder to view. I say desktop and it'll view desktop. See that? Here, this is not set for anything particular. So I can click in here, and I want to maybe bookmark this current folder. So this current folder is called the Sample Kings Hip Hop Kits slash Hip Hop Drum Kits, right? So I want to bookmark this. And now that I have, I click here, you'll see it now appears as a bookmark. See? So I can go over here, let's say, and this is desktop, right? And I can go to there. I can say, well, I want to make that a bookmark. So that could be the bookmark now. And so is this. They're the same bookmark, which I really don't want to have. But this is just for demonstration purposes. I want to go back and make that just desktop. And now it's desktop. This is a bookmark to my full collection of samples, over 68,000 samples I have there, which is awesome. And then here, this leads into my library. So that's how we can set up our browser section here to have specific files. And I can also make any one folder I want and bookmark that folder. And if I don't want to have that bookmark in, I can go back here and say, remove current folder from bookmark. Now, I have to actually be in that bookmark first. And then to remove it, I'll go here, click here. Remove current folder from bookmark. Click on that, and it's removed from the bookmark. See, it's no longer there. But I want to bookmark the current folder. I can keep it. Go here, it's back in there. And that's how we can keep these folders and everything going on. Now, also, within these bookmarks I have here, I can also go ascending or descending. See, right there, ascending or descending. Right there. That's pretty cool. Now, I can also Again, here I can also right click here and I can add. I can say, Well, I want to see size, and now it's been added to it. And I can move this back to here, and I can see size right there. We can see the size, right? I can also say, I want to see the path. And now I can see the path and where it leads to, and this will work just for that particular folder, see? But just for this setting, for this bookmark right here. I can also resize these titles for each column. I can resize them and see what types there are, see that? I can resize the date modified. I can also say it's date modified and also ascending or descending. Same with the name as well. Not with the path, and the size I can do that too, ascending or descending, but not with the path. I can also, let me click right in here where it says name again, and I can also make the live packs of column two. As you can see, live packs. So if I had live packs here, and they were here in the system, I would say, okay, I can see them. Here they go, right there, live packs. If I had live packs, this is the column for it, and I can adjust that column also as well, as you can see there. Also, we lost it right there for a second. So these are the many ways you can get around and help you to organize yourself within your browser and help you get the file types right, the path, the size. And also remember, we can always bookmark any one of these three browsers and bookmark any folder that we find or any section on our hard drive. You want to bookmark it? You can do that.
Recording MIDI requires a specific bunch of procedures. You gotta make sure you go step by step, you check your ins, your outs, what MIDI channel, and how you wanna record. And that's what this video is all about. So, let's get started. First of all, as you can see, I've got a track, which is audio, and one's MIDI. And what I wanna do now is I'd like to set up for MIDI. So, first I wanna do is hit my keyboard, and I'm not getting no no love here. Nothing's going on. See, right here, I should have a light going on. As you've seen before, there should be some sort of light activity happening here within the MIDI channel track. Also here, where we have the drop MIDI effects and audio effects instruments or samples here in this section, to the left of it, this should be lit a little bit like the keyboard pads. So, or the pads. So I'm going to go here, and we're going to go to Preferences and Live. You can do that on a Mac by going Command, Comma, or on a PC, it's Control, Comma. You can see right here, that's what it says right there. So now I'm gonna pull up the preference window and find out why. Now here we are on MIDI Sync. Uh, it recognizes my control service, the Auxium Pro. It recognizes the input, which is right there, and it recognizes the output and the input. Right, so, but here, the input MIDI ports, this should be on. So I click that on, I hit the key, or now you see it. Now you see something going on. You see that right here? You see that light going on right there. And now I know I've got my MIDI input on. So I'll turn this off. And next what I want to do is play it again. And yep, we got something happening. So next, I want to load up a sound into my MIDI track here. So I'm going to load up this uh, Akai 808 drums. Double tap that or press return and it's going to recognize the MIDI track that's available. It will let MIDI track up, and it also will arm the track so it's ready for recording. We'll see here this slide is red, and of course that means we're ready to record. Now, play the keyboard again. Oh, now we can hear something. Oh, that's kind of loud. Let's bring it down a little bit right here so we can get busy with it. Okay, so we got some sounds going on there, obviously. As I hit them, you can see the view meter here light up in green. And we also see it happening here, over here. And we see it in the master as well. So we know we've got something going on, right? So in order to record, though, I want to do a few things here, show you some other ideas here. That is because we're set, we're all ready to record. It is in record mode. You can also just put it in monitor mode. Suppose you had tracks down already, and you wanted to hear how this drum set sounded, or maybe it might be a keyboard, how that sounds along the other tracks. Well, we go here to this, turn this off, and this is monitor input, and we still hear it, and everything lights up the same way. Of course, it recognizes that my MIDI controller is sending information in, it's triggering the sample sounds, and it's working, but we're not recording. Be aware of that. So if I go to here, turn this off, and go to here to auto, and press this on, you notice another thing too, look, I'm playing a keyboard, nothing's happening. But the sides here of this module here, this Akai 808, this rack right here is lit, but you don't see a sound coming here. Okay, in order to get that, you must click here, and now we have the input coming through. Be aware of that also as well, because you might ha not have it activated, and it will cause some problems down the line. Now also here, we have MIDI from. Now we're getting MIDI from this device right here. I could select it and put it there if I wanted to, but no need for that, because I'm only using this device and whatever's coming through. So I'm only playing on one instrument, so it's gonna come through that. I have no need to select anything. So it says all instruments. Whichever setting it out, I'm gonna take it in from this track. I'm only recording one at a time. If I had multiple tracks, I might do something different. So here, we have channel. I'm not going to select all channels because I'm taking anything from all channels. I can go maybe one channel, channel one. I can get channel one if I want to do that. Or I may set channel two. Now channel two is not sending. So I obviously realize that this keyboard is only sending on channel one. And sometimes you, it's good to know that information too as well when you start working with a keyboard. But in this case, I'll go from all channels. It doesn't make a difference to me. It's going to come in. It's going to be that one me channel. I'm going to get one bit of information coming in anyway. And that's important in this particular case when I am recording. And you should realize that. So 
If I want to record here, I can go to here, I want to get a tempo. I need to know how fast it's going to be, how slow it's going to be. Hey, we got to find this out. So I can grab this, as you know, and slide down, drag down, drag up, or I can go to my keypad, one, zero, zero, and I may use something at the decimal. I may want to put something at the decimal. I may go point five, five. Hey, a real accurate tempo. How's that? Even though I normally wouldn't want to do that, but hey, ain't going to hurt you. This way, I'm saying this, one, this is how it works. Now, I'm going to go here, and we're going to click on the metronome. So next, I'll press the space bar. I'm going to go back here. I'll try. So it changes quickly and accurately. That's pretty good. So I'm almost ready here. It looks like it's pretty good. We've got our setup going on. We've got a metronome. We've got the tempo. And we're ready to record, obviously.